Fearscape Media Network, exploring the unknown, one podcast at a time. Hello, dear friends. I'm your head mister, Lord Stephen Gearhart. And I am your co-mister, the man with no name, Lance Wayne. And together we are the misters of the... the uh, Let's try it again. The misters of the... the, the, Lance! The misters of the dark! Don't shut up! Whatever. Join us wherever you stream your favorite podcasts or go to mistersofthedark.com where we'll be discussing all things horror from films and books to everything in betweensies. We also have the occasional victim. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, guest. <laughs> Only on the Fearscape Mania Network. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, Lance. Oh, I always get the last laugh. There are there phenomena, are phenomena that, that exist, exist all, all around us. us. Kids, Kids playing play above something and above flies over something and unknown disappears. flies over and disappears. People driving People at driving night, seeing, seeing huge, huge creatures, creatures cross, cross the road. The road. People waking up to find their cabinet door ripped, ripped open in their kitchen. Strange things happen, Strange things every, day happen around every day around the world and seemingly at the same time and area. But are these occurrences connected? connected? This This is is what we are here to explore explore and are trying to understand. Join us on our journey to uncover uncover what we call the The Convergence Convergence Enigma. Enigma. Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to the Convergence Enigma with Josh and Stefan, formerly Fearscape Paranormal Podcast here on the Fearscape Media Network. I am your host, Stefan Gearhart, and I am joined, as always, by my favorite Fortean investigator, Mr. Josh Rutledge. Hello, hello. Thank you uh, for that uh, heartfelt introduction. All right, um, now that that's done. No, I'm just joking. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just gonna say, much better than the last time when you said I look like a comparison between like a Twinkie and a and a Care Bear. So, I uh, mean, it's not. I'm. I wasn't wrong, but <laughs> you know, seriously though. So no. most of you have noticed our name has changed. We are no longer Fearscape Paranormal Podcast. We are now the Convergence Enigma. If you follow us on social media, you will now see the reason for this has been a long time coming we just moved it a little faster than we planned just because the slate of guests we've got coming on the topics that we've got Mm -hmm. coming up over the next few weeks uh it it was time you know anybody who's listened uh over the last probably 18 months well i've already picked up on the fact that when we cover a topic when we talk to a guest we don't look at one aspect of whatever it is so this is just a continuation, almost like an official announcement that, hey, that's where we're going to shift the focus to is looking at everything and how it converges together. Exactly. You know, that's exactly what we're saying, whether it be Sasquatch, uh, uh, ghost sighting, UFOs, UAPs, whatnot. We know that somehow it all leads together. Even some of this shaver mystery, hollow earth stuff yeah. that we're getting into. If you followed some of the stuff going on with wristwatch and uh, that whole adventure, so much has just been leading to that thought pattern mm-hmm. that all these high strangeness, paranormal roads all lead to the same thing. Our, our biggest example we always talk about is the Enfield haunting uh, in, in England. And at that same time that haunting was going on, there was a huge UFO yep. flap as well as numerous Sasquatch sightings within the area, yep. all within a few weeks, all, all right there. John Keel uh, very much talked about this phenomena in his own words. Yep. quite frequently so you know, uh so you know that, to be a, yeah thus is the reason why we are now the convergence enigma uh because we are going to really shift our focus to exploring that enigma and why and even how it all comes together like that yeah so uh anybody who's listening who has some 
convergence type things. Those are the things we really want to know about. We want to dig into. We want to try to figure out what are the data points here? Where does it point us to? Uh, so we have a new email address you can now hit us at contact at the convergence enigma dot com. Drop us those things. Let us know what you're seeing. Let us know what you're experiencing. We want to dig into it. Yep. And uh, the first start of that is us welcoming back a Fearscape guest alum. Uh, Mr. Jeremy McGowan is going to be on the show tonight, uh, the the man behind the Osiris. But he is also now a huge part of the UAPX project that is out there that is happening, that is is just taking his research, essentially, and those of Kevin Day and, and those with the Nimitz and things like that, and making it even more reliable and bigger on a bigger scale. So we're going to be talking to Jeremy me tonight so stick around for that uh but of course before we get to that let's get to our very first segment uh which is psychic term of the week and now the psychic word of the week all right josh psychic term of the week comes from the encyclopedic psychic dictionary by dr junji bletzer rest in peace honey bear uh, she is always guiding me, in my opinion, uh, and I asked her to find something really fun. So I flipped through the pages and I stuck my finger down. I landed on page 439 uh, and I landed on the occult police. And I said, Juji Bletzer, gods love you. God love you. So here's what the occult police is. Uh, it, it, the definition reads highly intelligent, etheric world intelligences who concern themselves with psychism applied toward criminal ends and offense against society answerable to anyone who needs help and calls upon them through telepathic communication. Hmm. So, I mean, this is psychic help. I, it's yeah, a psychic it really is. Line, man. Yep. It's uh, you just close your eyes and call call for help. It, it, it's like our, our girl that runs the um, the paranormal go- help desk. Paranormal help desk. I couldn't think I was going to say the ghost helpline. Uh, paranormal help desk. Like this is that, but for psychic stuff, right? So, yep. yeah. <laughs> So Very I don't, cool. yeah. So that there are entities or even persons that are out there uh, that are willing to hear you out and listen and be there. And I love that. I love that there's mm-hmm. this idea that we can be saved because what did we talk about? Uh, was it last week or the week before where we had that listener story that had the hat man, yeah. right? And there was part of the lore of the hat man was attacking you while you were astral traveling. Right. Yeah. Like, and so that's when I'm like, mm, I'm about to call psychic 911. It makes you wonder if uh, if those uh, psychic police are actually out patrolling the astral plane. Maybe. Uh, I will say, Josh, uh, when you were here in Arizona uh, in December, um, I feel like uh, we had done a session and came across an entity that basically said he was a spirit cop Hmm. like i don't know if you recall i think you were channeling i can't recall um but yeah it was essentially someone saying yeah i i keep an eye on things i there's there's a dimensional pathway or gateway or something along Hmm. those lines near here that spirits are entering through and it's my job to watch and patrol yeah so i I do having gone back and listened to the looking listen to the recording i I do recall uh, that coming up, and it's interesting that at the time we didn't think anything of it, but now having read this term, you know, occult police, here we are, Junji <laughs> Bletzer, man. Where were you two months ago? <laughs> so, but yeah, that's very cool. Thanks, Stefan. Yeah, no worries. Always here for you, man. I got you. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go ahead and move to our segment before we get to uh, Jeremy McGowan and UAPX, which uh, this week is going to be our UAP sighting of the week. All right, Josh, UAP sighting of the week. What do we got? Where's it from? And uh, why, why did you choose this? This comes from Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, happened 12, 23, 21. So just a couple of days before Christmas. Are you pulling this from MUFON? I did pull it from MUFON. I did. And uh, the reason I picked this is it, I randomly selected it. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that, ladies and gentlemen. Mm-hmm. See, I try to blame Junji Bletzer for mine. So go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so 
goes like this. Through the sunroof while my wife was shopping for shoes, I noticed what I thought was a satellite because of altitude and speed. Then I wondered why it would be visible in daylight so clearly. They're hard enough to see at night. So it passed in a straight path through where I could no longer see it through the sunroof. I got out of my car in the mall area parking lot and tried to reacquire it visually. It took a few seconds because it was a very bright day, hardly any clouds though, and I found it again and suddenly its flight path changed. It had been going almost straight north from the south, then about 45 degrees above the horizon or so it stopped and began moving towards the east. At times it would disappear, then reappear in the same general area, where before it had been going straight, and at the same constant high speed, it was now moving much more slowly, and not in a straight line, but more of a ziggy zaggy through the air. That was when I noticed a second craft, completely identical to it, behind it in the sky, flying with it, but not connected to it, because they move independently, sort of up and down. I couldn't just how far away from where one from the other, but it was between two to three fingers if you hold it up to the sky. They appear to be plain, for lack of a better word, and one would seem to turn off and on separately, though only very briefly. I took a video from my cell phone knowing it would be crappy so far away on a bright cloudless day, but I did catch them. So, first of all, what is Ziggy Zaggy? Um, I never heard. Like a lightning bolt type no, thing. No, I know that, but I, I wouldn't have said Ziggy Zaggy. I would have said Zigzag. But whatever, Ziggy Zaggy, I love that. Um, it's also the sequel to the Ziggy comics, uh, in <laughs> case you were wondering. Uh, but he, it's his wife. It is. Oh, that, see, now I like that. Um, but no, dude, the second this guy said, oh, there's another one behind it, I was like, oh! I'm in and like I was just drawn right back in like it's already crazy enough to see one uh, or even one that's in formation with others right that those are yeah. pretty common sightings but to see them play uh, and to like um, dogfight jokingly I guess yeah. uh, how to speak that that almost feels to me more some along the lines of Chris Alexander's lights in the skies right that they're these entities that would fly around like like the fae would or the fairy would yeah I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, um, yeah, I mean, just the, yeah, the playing around was very interesting. Um, the the fact that it was proceeding on, uh, proceeding on a straight line and then changed, I mean, that alone, the stop and a change of direction is enough to set it aside, apart from almost any other aircraft that we know. The only other thing, and of course, I haven't, I didn't see it, right? So the only other thing that, I, that comes to mind is a drone but i mean can a drone move like that especially two of them i mean if they were kind of moving around the sky playing with each other you could have a drone that's flying along and all of a sudden somebody else flies another drone up there and starts interacting with it i don't know man it, this is one of those things where it's like i wish i could see with my own eyes i know to see what it's... he meant by playing with each other because if they're making sharp right short sharp right angle turns quickly and things like that i'm ruling out drone real quick yeah i mean i would too um and, and, and you know he does talk about how like they seem to like turn on and off like like they become visible and then not visible and then they're mm -hmm. visible and not like that that to me you know like a drone would be like a constant kind of you know shape in the sky right it right. wouldn't especially in the daylight in the nighttime it could have lights that turn off and turn back on but in the daytime they're either visible or they're not so well uh josh speaking of uap i wanted to bring this up uh you and i were on a road trip across country to bring some of your stuff to arizona uh we don't have time for a full creepy catch up tonight but i did want to uh have you talk about the sighting that you caught on the Psyonix uh, while we were stuck in the desert in New Mexico <laughs> for a few hours. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll give the abridged version. Uh, I'm sure this is the version my wife would have much rather be given than the, than the, the full, but uh, so yeah, right. We got off uh, the highway because it was like a nice dark area. We wouldn't see the stars, got the truck stock, 
uh, stuck in the in the dirt. But while waiting on the tow truck, decided to still take advantage of it and look at the night sky. Because, yeah, we um, were in the middle of nowhere, middle of nowhere, eastern New Mexico. I mean, the, the sky was just amazing. Yeah, we were on the other see. side of Tucumcari in between Amarillo and Tucumcari, New Mexico, just out yeah. in the middle of the desert. It was incredible. Like there was like a ghost town right up the road that was abandoned along Route 66. It was pretty cool. But anyway, so I broke out this, the psionics and I was just uh, kind of taking, you know, again, video of the night sky. And it, it, it was odd. Um, like I thought in my head, I thought, hey, if there's anything out there that wants to be seen tonight, I'm here and I'm videoing. And then I, I caught this light that just kind of like comes out of nowhere. It, it it moves across the sky and then it disappears again and it's like it, it's moving too slow to be in, in my opinion too slow to be a, like a meteorite or something um too fast uh to be or you know too i guess even fast to be like an aircraft or something we, we did check you know light radar 24 and the and all the uh, satellite stuff and all that kind of stuff and it, it doesn't look like any of those things and, and nor was there anything out there and i even remember remarking to you about how when we go out recently when we go out we don't see any satellites like every time we've gone out the last couple of times we don't see any satellites so um yeah i don't know i mean it is up on our youtube station our youtube channel um which you guys little... can see that youtube.com slash fearscape media uh check that out because it is on there i'd love to have everybody's opinion because i've looked at it a thousand times i was there it sits in the sky for a long time and streaks for too long up high it doesn't feel like a meteorite to me yeah. um, especially the way it just continued to glide I mean, I, across the sky and i've seen it. i've seen the meteorites that like kind of glance off the atmosphere like you, you see them a little bit and they're gone i've seen those and that's not what this is so yeah. I don't know. I don't so, know. Yeah. It was it was quite fascinating. But again, check that out. Let us know. Thank you, Josh, for sharing that. Um, but all right, if you're ready and I'm ready, I'm ready to get talking to Jeremy McGowan and talk about UAPX. Welcome back, everybody, here on the uh, Convergence Enigma. We are Ooh. talking with our really good friend here, Mr. Jeremy McGowan. Ooh. Welcome yes. back. <laughs> Welcome back, sir, back. dude. It is. I think we were just chatting that. I think it's been close to a year since we've seen yeah. each other. Yeah, almost a year. Almost. And uh, in that time, I think uh, Josh is now moving out to Phoenix. Like he's going to be out here now. Yeah. I mean, I got a baby coming in April. I mean, it's, it's all kinds of stuff has happened in a year, man. <laughs> man if- <laughs> It, it, it it's gone by so fast too. It how's has. the skies right how's the skies <laughs> full of weird stuff that i can't explain yet <laughs> yeah we can't either um i do know one of the big reasons we were anxious to have you on uh was to talk about the the nonprofit research organization uapx mm-hmm. uh you know uh, we do also like you of course and we want to talk you know to you about osiris and different stuff like that but um we are very anxious to start talking about uapx so i'm gonna hand it over to john let him do his thing yeah so i mean it, it's kind of my understanding jeremy is that you know you know when we when we had you on to talk about osiris and the osiris project you really wanted to take the data that you collected with osiris and make it available to the people um yeah. for them to come through for them to figure out you know what this thing is and that's kind of what uapx is at a broader scale is that right yeah, I was so lucky to get involved with UAPX because uh, literally, as, as you guys have said, it it's it's a larger version of the vision that I had for the Osiris project. You know, it's it's a group of people from all walks of life. We have uh, two physicists, uh, PhD type of physicists that work with the uh, University of Albany SUNY. Um, We have one PhD candidate who is a NASA trained commercial astronaut. He was actually instrumental in working on a joint Air Force and NASA, believe it or not, time travel project. Wow. Um, Yeah. Legit thing. I I had to look it up. Um, (laughs) And then, of course, we've got Gary Voorhees, Kevin Day and Jason Turner, who were all aboard the USS Princeton, part of the uh, the Nimitz battle group during the now infamous 2004 Tic Tac event. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the the amount of expertise that we have, the amount of equipment that we have and the singular shared vision that we have amongst us, it is taking the Osiris and putting it on steroids. 
Yeah, that's fantastic. I, I'm a huge Kevin Day fan. I think most people are aware of Kevin Day. I think yeah. his his face and voice seems to be the most uh, seen. And uh, boy, if there's someone that you're like, just <clears throat> right off the bat, whether it's on TV or in person, that you're like, I, I believe this guy. It's it's yeah. Kevin Day, man. There's just something about him that he just, wears everything on his sleeve. I mean, yeah. it's just, it's exactly right the there. way you put yeah. it. Like, you right know, this there. guy's not pulling your finger. Yeah. Well, unless you asked him to, you know, then, yeah. then he might pull. he's a nice guy. Yeah. I'll pull your finger. What do you yeah. want? But he just, he just strikes me as a, a pretty, pretty honest guy. And that Down to earth. Yeah. stands out yeah. to me more than anyone in the last few years uh, in any of this UAP UFO stuff that's out there. Like if Kevin Day speaking, I'm listening. Well, and it's yeah. I, I had the, the honor and, and privilege of being able to work with him for a, uh, a good, solid portion of uh, one of our major expeditions that we did with UAPX. And uh, and Kevin was was right there every morning and, and stayed with us until till we were uh, hitting the bunks again. <laughs> and uh, he, he busted his ass just around with the uh, the rest of us. So amazing well, I mean, guy. I remember the first time I think I saw him uh, being interviewed, you know, I don't, I don't remember what show it was or whatever, but it's kind of one of the first interviews that he did. Um, and what really struck me is, is he, he, he seemed very reluctant to do the interview, not because he didn't agree with whatever was being discussed, but just, he's, I don't think he's seeking out the limelight, right? He's not seeking out the attention. People are asking him questions. He's providing his information, but he's not, seeking attention he's not seeking glory and fame so. yeah and you know none of us at uapx are after that we uh we we've had we've had the devils that we've had to dance with mm -hmm. because science is expensive and these expeditions that we put together they're not cheap i mean our, our major expedition that was completed mid last year we had over a half million dollars of equipment. Some of it was mm. on loan from universities. Some of it was privately owned. Uh, some of it was stuff that we we built, bought, or, or otherwise manufactured ourselves. But just the the shipping, the room, the board, the insurance, the safety, mm -hmm. all things considered, you know, about five to seven days worth of work cost roughly sixty thousand dollars. So as a nonprofit startup. You know, yeah. we're not funded. We don't have that in our right. pockets. So when somebody comes over to us and says, hey, I'm going to fund your guys' entire expedition uh, in exchange for being allowed to watch, well, that's the devil that we have to dance with. Right, right. right. So, but, but I want to make sure that everybody understands that we do not bend the data or the facts or the measurements to fit the narrative yeah. of whomever is funding us. So... Yeah, I mean, I, I remember that when we had you on, when we talked about the Osiris stuff, is that, you know, you're a big proponent of if you go out and do an investigation and you don't find anything, still present what you didn't find, right? Still present whatever the data was, even though it may not point to whatever narrative somebody's trying yeah. to spin. Um, and, I, and, I really, and I really appreciate that because there are times, we, we talked about it when you were on before, mm -hmm. when, you know, you watch these shows on TV, and it's result after result after result. And it's just hard to believe that they kept, you know, hitting the mark every single time. Yeah. And, and you really know that they're not. And so well, it's, it's like really watching a pro golfer doing nothing but holes in one. You know that right. doesn't happen. <laughs> right. Exactly. This is Happy Gilmore. Which yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Uh, but Josh, it was like we were chatting with somebody last night, a friend of ours. And you had mentioned that it was like even zero evidence, zero uh results is still a result like it's a right? measured data point absolutely you know, right. and, and it can tell you one of two things well they can tell you a number of different things but mm -hmm. the primary two things that it can tell you is either you're doing things wrong or the equipment that you have is not suited for the task yes so yeah. if you well, get no results i mean if, yeah. if you're out sky watching you should see something whether it's birds bugs airplanes hang gliders paragliders helicopters you should see something mm -hmm. if you get nothing something's wrong yeah right. you know it's, it's one of the things i remember um uh, john keel when he uh collected all of his data together to write um uh, what was the book the eighth tower mm. um and you know i guess he's he's put together a narrative and so he collected all this uh sighting data over several years from newspaper articles that were being mailed to him and such and he basically come up came up with you know wednesdays and saturdays uh, are the best times to see UA UFOs and UAPs, <laughs> right. you know, between the hours of like 10 and 2 a.m. Uh, of course, this is all, you know, set on data back in the 60s. But um, and then for some reason, uh, 
July or, or no, June 24th. June 24th, I was going to say that. Yeah. is a significant date for UAP research and all the stuff that what he collected. Is June 24th, what is that? He, he's, he, there were like three dates I think he had picked that through all the research and things that he had done, that more high strangeness, paranormal, whatever activity correlated and happened on june 24th and i believe two other dates i, I yeah. can't remember there were june 24th dates. was like the main one that in history more things happened on that date than any other date so that was like another one of his his points was huh. you know to, uh was it was wednesdays and saturdays and yeah. june 24th and these two other dates i wish i had them handy right now <laughs> but, but yeah <laughs> but the idea that you know he had to collect all of that data right even data where things didn't happen to be able to narrow it down to these are the best times and dates for you to go out and see stuff so yeah yeah <clears throat> you know that's that's an interesting thing we've never looked at correlating the the saturation level of events with specific dates and times for you know looking back in history mm -hmm. that that'd be something i'd be interested in, in kind of <laughs> a deeper dive in uh, right <laughs> Well, you know, I, I, I even wonder, because, um, you know, so much we were talking about it the other night with uh, uh, another show we do that uh, with Starlink, since the launch of Starlink, mm -hmm. so many reports, so many reports <laughs> um, are Starlink reports. I mean, I, you know, we, we usually do a segment on the show uh, where we, we do, you know, UAP sighting of the week. I jump out to MUFON and I try to find a good UAP sighting to report back to our audience. And there are so many that I see. I saw a string of lights moving across the sky and it's just. You know, I, it almost be to say, go back to before Starlink was first launched. And that's the data you care about, yeah. uh, because I think since then, you're going to have a lot of uh, uh, false reports that you're going to. I mean, it makes in. me even want to go to MUFON and say, can I clean up your database? Well, you would think, yes. And you would think that we've we've now had the five observables, six mm -hmm. technically, for the better part of almost three years now. Yeah. Why aren't people filtering their events by at least yeah. the five observables? Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, when Heineck came out with his close encounters, boy, everybody was checking what type of close encounter they had. But, yeah, these five observables aren't 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 yeah, they're not mainstream. being used. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, a, think about a that a string right. of small lights going across the sky is literally zero of the five observables. Right. Um, the other thing is, is and I don't know, um, I, I've, I've emailed some folks to ask about, but as a MUFON member, you know, I can go out and I can search the reporting database. Hmm. But I, I see really the, the public facing reports. So I see what everybody put in with their images and all that kind of stuff. I'd love to see what MUFON investigators are tagging these things at. Because I would imagine that as an investigator, they have some sort of another database or another view of the database even where they're classifying things as Starlink or whatever the case may be. I'd love to get my hands on that detail. So. Yeah, I have no idea how MUFON works. Yeah, internally. I know. None. But it's just, it would just, you know, if, if they're really about data sharing, it would think that, you know, they would make some of that stuff available. So. But uh, anyways, <laughs> back to UAPX, I, I do want to also say um, we were talking to someone uh, a couple of weeks back and uh, uh, they were kind of uh, hitting UAPX a little hard because there was some footage that they had that UAPX wouldn't look at. And I was looking out mm -hmm. at your all's website, you know, the other day, and I noticed that there's kind of like your rules of engagement, if you will. Which I'm looking and, at right now. <laughs> and one of them is you don't look at anybody else's data than your own. No, we're not going to. Right. So it's not that you, you know that you singling out this guy. You know, you just no. that's your general rule. Yeah. Data that is collected by somebody else is not going to be reviewed for scientific measurements by UAPX unless. It comes from a source of provenance. We understand their method of data collection. They have all the I's dotted, all the T's crossed. You know, it's somebody that has gone out and maybe they've published their own papers before or had their papers published or they're, they're you know, instrumental in this research. But if somebody just sends us a video or a still picture or a collection of pictures, yeah, we know nothing. 
We don't know the camera type. We don't know when they were there. We don't know where they were. They probably don't even know the azimuth or the directionality that their camera was pointed in. They probably don't have a secondary PDF telling us what the weather, the temperature, the humidity, and you know the UV index was. There's probably been no records or recording of any flight tracks from like Flight Radar 24 or anything, not even the most basic minuscule amount of information. So why would somebody expect an organization such as us that uses, you know, half a million dollars worth of scientific equipment yep. to do these same studies to take our physicists and our researchers and say, hey, can can you sit down and, and take two or three hours of your very valuable time and look right. at Bob's Polaroid? It, it's, <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, it's like you're not MUFON, right? I mean, that's what MUFON is. Yeah. MUFON collects this type of data and they look at it and have fun with it and, and go from there where if you were open to that you had you don't have time for the amount of excuse me but shit yeah. you would get like you right. know just the the amount of yeah. stuff that would come across the, the board the string of lights moving across the sky <laughs> right <laughs> when just you so do you indeed know. you have all that information there that yeah. you're using i i would want that as someone looking at uapx i'd rather have that than a video some guy in venezuela sent you yeah and and just so you guys know even our own data that we record ourselves our analysis isn't just, you know, us sitting down over a cup of coffee, looking at a picture and going, mm -hmm. eh, it's a UFO. No, we're we're writing custom neural nets, uh, customized AI and machine learning applications to do, uh, you know, super imaging resolution and size and shape analysis and analysis. Um, we're, we're, we're looking at tertiary sources of information that can back up what we know to be a triangulation point. You know, we go to LIGO or Ernie or, you know, pull information from NEXRAD weather radar just to confirm that there was an object that one of our cameras saw. Then we go back to all of our ancillary equipment mm -hmm. and say, okay, what was the temperature on the FLIR? Did the quantum random number generator jump any? Do we have anything on the cosmic watch? Do we have any other ancillary data? Right. Our images, even our own images to us don't mean crap. Yeah. 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 Just like you said, you're not sitting there looking at a picture going, well, that's good enough for History Channel. <laughs> <laughs> right. But it right. does sound like because we do have some amateur UFO hunters in Kentucky. They're the same way. They're like, well, Earl's hair was standing up. That's 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 pretty standard. We got there. He's got his jar of moonshine was bubbling. OK, that doesn't normally happen unless it's a full moon. So, you know, there's data right. points in different places, man. Yeah, but it, there, there is We're, our place is deeply, deeply rooted into repeatable, testable, measurable and understandable. And, you know, we're not going to we're not going to take a photograph of a flock of birds and call it something that it's not. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's and and I don't want to discourage people from going out and taking these pictures and trying to do their own research and study. Uh, but we're not the organization yeah. that is going to research those. Yeah, that's, well, and, that's not your guys' focus. No. And, 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 you know, just as a as a reminder, like you just said, if you're going to be that person, if you're going to go out uh, in a field close to your house and take a psionics or just a camera or whatever and go out there and try to catch something, record, right? Record the time that you see it. Record what the temperature was. What direction were you facing? How far off the horizon was it? I'll, I'll like record all that extra detail along with your picture, because even though you're all you all UAPX is not going to look at it when you submit your MUFON report, if you do, yeah. and you provide all that additional detail, you're more likely to get a call from a MUFON investigator to figure out what's going on there than just saying, here's a picture of a, a still picture that I took. <laughs> of something in the night sky and your yeah. call with MUFON investigator will last less than two hours like mine did because i didn't write any of that stuff down yeah <laughs> <laughs> they're like well do you know what the temperature was i'm like it was christmas in phoenix uh, so yeah, yeah and you know even <laughs> one of the things I, I had an interesting experience when i was in the military not ufo related but i was in uh where was i, I was in kuwait uh during desert storm mm. and i was out on desert patrol with my fire team and way off in the distance we saw a uh, triple a fire anti-aircraft artillery fire going up in the air um it wasn't a direct threat to us because we're on the ground uh, but we had to call it in and the the biggest thing that we could do at that moment was just take the heel of our boots 
and mark the location of where we were and draw a big old arrow in the sand pointing at the direction of mm. where the triple a fire was coming in so when the sun comes up the next morning you know we could do a better triangulation and a better yeah. understanding of exactly where it was so i mean you know if you're out at night and you don't record the data mark something take a yeah. knife and scratch mm -hmm. an arrow on the side of the sidewalk or right. something pointing at the direction that you were you know where you were standing in the direction you were looking just for future reference and also, I mean, something that I try to do anytime that I have a signing that I'm not sure about if I don't get a picture or even if I do is I, I, I like come home and I write down my experience. You know, I, I, I journal it out, if you will. Yeah. The thing that I saw, uh, I note if I noticed if it was breezy or if the moon was out or if I saw any other stars or whatever the case would be, because you're probably going to forget that information uh, by the time it comes time to talk to somebody about it. So. Yeah. Yeah, there's and there's so many apps out there on the phone. I mean, if you're doing if you're doing amateur and, and, and I don't mean amateur in a bad way, I just, yeah, mean, just you know, not yeah. with a professional organization. Right. If you're doing these these UFO UAP sighting events, you know, download the uh, the Sky Scanner app, download Flight uh, Radar 24 yep. and try to prove yourself wrong. Right. Before anybody else drags you over the coals. Yep. I mean, we do. We uh, it's something we learned with our own stuff is Flight Radar Twenty Four, uh, the uh, Starlink app to find where Starlink is. Uh, you know, there's a you know Sky Safari that we use for like mm -hmm. where all those different satellites are, where the International Space Station is, and everything. So yeah, uh, like you said, try to prove yourself wrong before you go public and somebody points out that it's the International Space <laughs> Space. Station. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, but uh, so I do want to talk real quick about. Uh, Osiris, because yeah. I, um, I, I am very interested in what you've got going on. We're there, still Rick. obsessed with Osiris. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I know that you've added some additional equipment since we last talked, because I've been following you as you build some things and things like that. Um, are you still? going strong with the osiris rig or you... the osiris is currently down for a refit and a uh, basically a, a, a redo um after our our primary expedition that we completed last year there was a lot of things a lot of lessons learned about uh how the osiris operates what it's capable of um there were some instances in uh not in our primary expedition but a secondary one where i managed to capture uh, uh an object I'm, I'm not even going to say yeah. if it was UAP or not, but an right. object appeared in the visual field of one camera, but it wasn't being picked up by the second camera, mm -hmm. even though both cameras were the same makes and the same sensors and the same everything. It didn't appear in one and it did in the other. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to replot where the equipment goes. Yeah, uh, I've added uh, some RF signal analyzers and, and all sorts of other types of non-imaging uh, yep. sensor technology to the vehicle because I, I think it's really really important to get a a decent photo or video but it's not nearly as important as having the secondary measurements you know radiation detection yeah. uh, with uapx we're, we're currently building a very large uh, rooftop sized uh, uh, cosmic ray detector that is going to yeah. be integrated into the osiris um we're we're building you, you it, it's unimaginable the stuff that we're putting into this vehicle um are you all have you all looked at doing a radio telescope uh as well not necessarily a radio telescope but i have been well i have started on the very early stages of building what's called a passive radar um so the the difference between an active radar and a passive radar is active radar actually beams out the right. radar waves and it, it uses the object to re as a reflective uh, source and it, it receives the reflectivity of that radar signal highly regulated by the fcc you have to right. have licenses yeah. and all sorts yeah. of things you, we, we can't do that right a passive radar is basically a radar receiver but our airways are filled with radio stations and television broadcasts right. and cd and all these other transmissions that are going out these are all being reflected just like a regular radar right. is right so in building just the receiver side of it we can actually create through software a 3d map of the aerial environment around the osiris well that's awesome 
and I really want to, and I really want to see it. But <laughs> it's getting um, there. It's getting yeah. there. But you know, again, this stuff isn't cheap. No, I, I know. I, I think I saw you were looking uh, a couple months back on Instagram for like a, an old um, uh, antenna, like a house antenna. I guess maybe that was for something that you're working on there, but uh, or like a motor where you could turn the antenna. So, I, yeah. yeah, that uh, was. I actually, I actually ended up building that. You're trying and, to pick uh, up the honeymooners. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> but I now on the front of the Osiris, on the hood of the Osiris, I have a uh, a very focused uh, antenna that will sweep back and forth and it will display on my uh, software defined radio display in the front seat. I will be able to see the uh, uh, the spectrographic readout of the RF spectrum. And once I isolate a certain signal, I can, can stop the antenna yeah. and stop it from, you know, panning. And then I can actually move the Osiris because it's a vehicle and right. look for the, uh, the decibel increase in the signal and try to locate the source of a signal. That's, the, the tech side of me is exploding right now so <laughs> <laughs> no that, that's just amazing um yeah oh man i what I'm, I'm speechless when when i get out to arizona we're definitely gonna have to to get together i'm gonna have to just drool over your rig I'm, I'll, I'll clean it up though so um. <laughs> speaking of hot no breath um, yeah really <laughs> my question to you is and answer this if you can or not i don't sure. know but i i feel you know you guys one of the big things that points out is hey we're doing all this stuff uh one of the things here it talks about is uh reviewing and analyzing data uh to fill in the gaps tech you know in sensor technology identified by the u.s government but without governmental involvement have they been breathing down your necks, the government? Not directly. Um, we we don't typically trust the U.S. government. I mean, they've lied about this whole mm -hmm. UFO phenomenon yeah. to the, the general public for at least, at least the last 70 years. Um, so whatever they come out with has to be taken with a grain of salt in, in whatever regard they say it has. We don't know if we're being monitored there's no way for us to yeah. know if we're being monitored but there was a hard drive that we were mailing to other members of our team that contained well the hard drive was alleged to have contained <laughs> uh some data on it and it went missing from a mail room mm -hmm. uh, just disappeared the package arrived the content did not um luckily for us we had uh, it was basically a test the hard drive was blank, hmm. but the information that we had put out prior to mailing it to our internal team was that, you know, hey, this is this is going to contain this data and that uh, that hard drive went missing. Interesting. You know, when your life starts to look like a movie or X-Files or something like that, it's time to be like, I think we're on the right track. Here. Yeah. <laughs> like, and then I, I also had another hard drive that was actually stolen out of the Osiris. Jeez. That's crazy, man. And it was with with all the equipment that I've got in the Osiris. The only thing that was yeah, that was the hard drive. Hard drive. Wow. Yeah, but yeah, you just like you said, you know, like um, today when we recorded this, so this was a week prior um, on the debrief. Chris Mellon had an article that came out uh, and just did an interview with uh, Chrissy Newton, and then he's basically calling out the Air Force, saying, "Hey, why have you guys been AWOL through all of this?" Yeah, you know, and so that's interesting to be talking it, about the government here, and yet here we are. Well, you know, believe it or not, I don't think the Air Force has much. Oh, I don't either, but I I still think they're they're still got a little Project Blue Book shy. <laughs> well, <laughs> if, if you think about it, the Air Force probably doesn't have much because anything that the that the majority of people would ascribe as mm -hmm. Air Force technology is probably agency owned and operated, or yeah. NRO owned and operated under the flag of the u.s air force mm -hmm. yeah didn't even think about that but yeah absolutely now what about space force guys <laughs> you know i it's too early to tell <laughs> I, what, I mean what has do have high force, hopes for it but <laughs> what has space force done since their inception i think they they've logo. created their uniform yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is almost identical to the tv show which is really if you've watched the the um battlestar galactica no, no, <laughs> just the space. No, the Space Force show on oh, was it Netflix with, with um, uh, Stephen. Oh, whatever his name is, Carell. Steve Carell. Steve Carell. Yeah. It is hilarious, but it is literally 
what's kind of all they've done. Cause like the first two or three episodes was literally about choosing the uniform and uh, things like that. And then here we are months, you know, a year later, whatever from the, just that show airing. And you're starting to see yeah. some of those things that happened in the show. I'm like, are y'all even watching the show? Cause you're making fun of yourselves. You don't realize <laughs> And season two is about to drop. So I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess nice. I'll be watching that too. But it's, it's, it's funny because you know, like any good writing, uh, there's always some real truth mixed yeah. in. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah. that's, that's They've got advisors on the show. Oh, yeah. Hands down. Hands down. It's uh, Richard Dean Anderson. He's advising them. So <laughs> <laughs> Now, that would actually be awesome. <laughs> he's I mean, he's one of the few celebrities that I would actually like to sit down with and have a beer. Yeah, all oh, for I sure. Just, I I would just be mad because I would want to bring him like some duct tape, a plastic cup, some dog hairs, and a plunger, and I would be like, I need you to make me a bomb. Right. And if he didn't do it, I'd be really upset. <laughs> and so I can't. That's one of those things where they say you don't want to meet your heroes, and I think yeah. that might be one of them. <laughs> Well, see, I know you were you were never a Stargate fan, Stefan. So that's that's where I'm a I'm... Stargate movie fan. Yeah, but yeah. But so the kid from uh, that that weird movie that I can't think of. I don't know what you're talking I can't about. Think of it now. <laughs> Camera. So, um, I know that you are not allowed to talk a lot about this, but I don't know if you can give us. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't know if you can give us just like a little tease. Okay. Um, you all did some stuff last year. Uh, that's going to be released in some sort of a video format in the near future. Yeah. So our NDA was very specific and it told us that we could not discuss anything that had not been publicly disclosed. Uh, luckily for you and your audience, uh, the, uh, the production company sent out a tweet yesterday saying that the trailer to this film would be released very soon. So yes. it is out there in public knowledge that UAPX did in fact participate in a documentary event on uh, on one of our expeditions. Excellent. Can't, well, cannot I cannot wait it. and we will obviously be sharing that bad boy out. So <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's you know fear. it was it was a really fun project to do. Uh, obviously, you know, it was it was what enabled our expedition. Uh, and we're extremely mm -hmm. grateful for having the opportunity to go out and be able to collect actionable data on the UFO UAP phenomenon. Um, what I am truly, truly excited about, uh, you, you would think that being in a documentary that's getting released and things like that would be, you know, the, 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 the heart pump. But I'm really, truly excited uh, for our scientific papers to get published and get released. That's that's what has me personally uh, truly vested in this whole project. You know, I am, too. And, and the reason I'll say so is because I remember before um, Unidentified came out and all of that came out, um, there were a number of us that already had our fingers dipped into to the stars academy and the, the papers that they were pushing the things that they were putting out there uh and i was reading those every chance that i got and it seemed like when unidentified came out those kind of quit and mm. so it's kind of like it kind of it's weird and, and now i know i know we got lou and them they left uh ttsa and that's fine um whatever and i guess tom wants to do a little more entertainment -y type things but i miss that research that's why something hearing you guys talk uapx i'm like this is again back to in some ways back to what i was so excited about to the stars about in the very beginning was just this information and this research yeah. being put out publicly and yeah I and we're doing we're doing things a little differently as well because not only are we going to come out with the scientific papers but we're going to release the raw data at at the same time or near the same time that the papers come out in the hopes because you know, we're not in this for a Nobel Prize. We're not in this for fame or fortune. We're in this for answers. So obviously our physicists get the first crack at our data and the papers that they write and get published are going to be the first representation of the quality of the data. But we also want the rest of the world to be able to review everything that we did. So we're going to give access to academia and to science and to universities, mm -hmm. all of our raw data so that they can start from zero and try to either prove us correct or prove us wrong or say, holy crap, you guys missed this or something, right? Because again, we're not looking for the Nobel Prize. We're looking right. for the correct answer. You're looking for a collaboration towards the truth. Yes. 
Yes, 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 yes. Um, <clears throat> so I, I did want to say I, I, I think I saw something early on when you first kind of joined UAPX, um, and I, I could be wrong, um, but did you all kind of shift your focus from land to sea at some point? Uh, I think it's vice versa. Um, okay. It was, it was more sea to land. Uh, obviously, Kevin Dagg and Gary Voorhees and Jason Turner were the original three for UAPX. Mm -hmm. um, and being in the Navy, it was an obvious, uh, you know, go to do what you know. Uh, you know, they all spent years and decades upon decades collectively in the United States Navy. So it only made sense right. for them to uh, want the well, the original idea of UAPX was to get uh, a, a charter fleet put together with the sensor technology and go back to the Catalina Channel and try to study the phenomenon as it had occurred mm -hmm. to the Nimitz battle group, you know, recreate as much of the environment as they could and, and drop the sensors and, and try to pick up on something if it was repeatable in the Catalina Channel. Um, after Gary had sat down and put pen to paper and figured out what the budget for that would be, <laughs> it was like, you know, let's let's stick to the dirt. Yeah. Um, have you all looked at using, um, and you may have, but like uh, the national, I'm going to totally blank on the name, but the, the people who monitor seismic activity, I, I'm totally blank, G, oh, geo, yeah, yeah. you know, but to, we, to see if there's stuff that's going on even underground that might be worth detecting. We talk to everyone. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I've got an email, if, if I could show you, I would, but uh, uh, at one of our major expeditions, uh, we detected some anomalous uh, uh, radiation readings, and we don't know what caused them yet. We're still still digging into that. Uh, it could likely be a, an undiscovered magnetar, which in and of itself would be a really cool discovery for us to have made. But the 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 flux on this was so significant that. I determined that it would probably be registered by radio stations and television stations and things like that. Mm. So, you know, we've we've reached out to uh, NOAA, the National Atmospheric or Oceanic and uh, Atmospheric Association. We've reached out to uh, LIGO and Ernie, uh, places like McMurdo Station in Antarctica, to mm. try to confirm, you know, a lot of these readings that we're getting, all the way down to uh, local television stations in that area to see if they maintain an interference log, mm. just so we can get as much secondary yeah, yeah. and tertiary data that confirms dates and times and places and things like yeah. that. Yeah, so it sounds like that uh, you all really uh, have your uh, S together over there. <laughs> so we we, um, we try. Now we're not infallible, but you know, no, we, we are but, probably going to make a million more mistakes than we do things right. But uh, to my knowledge, this is the first time it's ever been done. I mean, it's it's got to be better than the government at this point. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting you say that because right now the equipment that UAPX has outside of the Spy One radar that was used on the Nimitz, we probably have better equipment for directly measuring alleged UAP than the US government did in 2004. Hmm. Interesting. I, I don't disagree with that at all. I mean, it's, you know, technology, of course, the technology that you're using now uh, was probably introduced to the military first and then it became available in public hands, just like everything else is. So, Well, with the exception of one thing that we have, and to to my understanding, I don't think anybody has ever used this, uh, mostly because it just came out, but MIT designed what they call the Cosmic Watch. And it's not this type of watch. It's like <laughs> this type of watch, right? Cosmic watching. Um, but it is, a, uh, it is a scintillator device that is able to pick up cosmic rays. And then you can use statistical analysis to differentiate between gammas and muons and, and mm -hmm. all sorts of energetic particles. Um, but this was one of the, the key pieces of equipment that we utilized on our uh, on our primary expedition. Mm -hmm. uh, so real quick, we only have a couple more minutes before I get to asking you about, um, you know, all your plugs and everything like that. What's a, what's a typical day? Like, that's what I want to know. What's a typical day for UAPX when you guys saying today's the day? I mean, you're saying you saying that Kevin Day's getting up with you guys and then they're hitting the bunks with you guys. What's, what's a short version of a typical day for you guys when you're going out and doing research? You know, if we're in the field and this, God, it, it's not what I want it to be. 
um, because like I said earlier, we, we have the devil that we have to dance with. Mm -hmm. So if, if our expedition is being funded by somebody making a documentary or making a TV show sure. or, or something, you know, there are things that interfere with our day-to-day -day operations. I would love to be able to put together a fly on the wall type of production where there is no, okay, well, can you guys do this at six because mm -hmm. union rules say they can't film, you know, what, whatever it is. Right. Sure. Um, luckily for us, our equipment works with or without us. Right. So yeah, a typical day for UAPX is honestly not doing the boots on the ground research. It's the months and months and it's months afterwards where we're sitting crunching. down and we're analyzing. Yeah. yeah. We're running the numbers and we're, I mean, my God, we, Yesterday, two, with the last the last 48 hours, I've been processing one Excel spreadsheet that has over 1,800,000 lines on it, where I plotted the location of every single AIS transmitting vessel on the globe, and then had to go back and isolate the ones that were not in a specific geographic area, pull out all the pleasure craft, and just look for the unknowns or the military uh, vessels that were in the area to try to find what their capabilities would have been mm. to go back and create a FOIA to look for the deck logs on those ships. Wow. It's the, the amount of post-processing in this stuff is insane. Definitely some eye straining activity there. So <laughs> for sure. Uh, but Jeremy, uh, thank you again. Uh, where, where can they find information on uh, the Osiris and UAPX and just anything else out there that you wanted to kind of shout out? Yeah. So the uh, UAPX website is really easy. It's just UAPX.space. Uh, it, uh, it will default to our, our main website, but it's just easier to say UAPX.space. Um, the Osiris uh, and my personal page is just Jeremy D. McGowan, uh, dot com. Perfect. And I noticed on there real quick that there are some uh, opportunities out there for people that want to volunteer. Um, I thought that was really interesting. Uh, they're, they're coming. They're not they're there coming. Yet. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I know that that'll be and I'm sure looking at data. <laughs> well, <laughs> our, the volunteers that we're looking for initially when we're ready to mm -hmm. open up the floodgates mm -hmm. is, you know, we're going to be looking for people that are uh, like uh, C++ coders, Go, right. Golang uh, guys, people that have experience in AI and machine learning. Uh, that's going to be first and foremost. Mm -hmm. So we're going to drop down to image analysis. Then we're probably going to be looking at geospatial intelligence type of, uh, of folks with uh, that expertise. Uh, also, you know, if 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 they're uh, geophysicists, if they're astrophysicists, all of these types of expertise we're going to be looking for on a volunteer basis until we become funded. Perfect. And, I, and yeah, keep your eyes peeled for that, folks. I know we have a lot of listeners that do a lot more stuff than we even realize. So keep your eyes open if you're sure. interested in that. And also, if you're on the uh, UAP ex uh, uh, Expeditions website, I noticed that you all have a Discord server. Yes. Um, I just joined it. Uh, there looks like some pretty active conversation going We're on there. So Doing that now. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it's a way to maybe get in uh, on the action a little bit. Yeah, so. and we actually have a, a weekly thing we do, which call, it's there's a Discord channel for it. It's called Ask a UAP Physicist. Oh. And every week we collect questions from the, uh, the members of the UAPX Discord server. And then one to three or four of the questions are selected by our physicists and they provide an answer that we then post both on the discord and on the mm. uapx blog that's awesome you're going to be that's... like josh stop sending in questions yeah <laughs> but no thank you so much jeremy McGow mcgowan oh cyrus we love it we can't wait to see it transform into a transformer someday that's what i'm hoping for <laughs> mm -hmm. uh but uapx uh you guys check that out uapx.space again thank you jeremy and i know we'll see you again man thank you guys pleasure to be here Thank you very much, Jeremy. Always a pleasure. Uh, yes. And I did look up the date, Josh. It was February 24th of last year that we had Jeremy on. So, so darn almost near yeah. by, you know, like, just shy of a week or whatever since yeah. we had him on last time. And that was completely unintentional. It didn't even. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, 
it is it's like 11 11 months and three weeks or something you know it's crazy yeah pretty pretty amazing stuff uh again check out uapx.space uh there's a lot of really cool information there i know we are absolutely fascinated by this constantly uh you know like i said yeah, I, the I'm osiris just, i'm like if we could get out there and just just, just, I just want, I just want to ride in it and watch yeah, the no. data being collected. Like right. that, I know you're like, ooh, how's this working? What's the yeah. engine sound like? I'm like, <laughs> I just want to look at the data and see if I can catch me a UFO. So, yeah, I mean, it just, yeah, I mean, all, all of it, right? And, and to be able to see it, to be able to ride in it, to be able to maybe go out and do an expedition, expedition, that would be awesome too. Um, you know, I'll, I'll pay for gas. You know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, it, I'll it, buy you know, the Cheetos, man. Like, um, I'm, you know, I'm d- there. does does it run on Mister Fusion? You know, we have a banana uh-huh. peel, it's a beer. I mean, <laughs> so is it that? Or uh, wouldn't it like uh, Willie Nelson uses uh, like corn uh, corn oil or something like yeah. that? He always did biodiesel. Yeah. No, but I mean, like back in the day, he would just buy like vegetable oil or whatever, and he would put it in his car, like for something a long time ago. I can't remember. <laughs> I mean, it's people buy used vegetable oil from restaurants and they use it to make biodiesel. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's probably what you're thinking of. But yeah, maybe. I don't know. I just it's Willie Nelson. So I was like, that man can do it every once. His beard says so. His beard <laughs> but says no. So. Um, yeah, it was a very, you know, and I think the the interview tonight with Jeremy really kind of fits in with, you know, kind of our 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 theme, right, that we're trying to go after here. And that's, you know, collecting data points from all different avenues to see what else is kind of interacting and happening when, when these things kind of show up and happen. So uh, to try to pinpoint down, you know, my ideal, right. Ideal situation, they collect enough data to be able to use like AI or machine learning and Mm -hmm. predict and predict when the next window and where the next window will be. Yeah. That's, that's kind of the hope, man. Um, yeah keep an eye i'm telling you man keep an eye on uh uapx i think some big things are going to be coming um like i said i I miss ttsa dropping stuff and we just don't see that anymore so uh, in the meantime i've got my uapx with some hard data uh, not just speculative so i'm very excited about that uh josh before we go uh, I want to remind people, we are now the Convergence Enigma. You can go to, to theconvergenceenigma.com uh, and find the same information you used to find for Fearscape yeah. here Normal Podcast. <laughs> we are still a part of the Fearscape Media Network. Uh, that is not going away. Josh and I are still doing tech talk with the debrief. Uh, I believe this week we've just dropped the Halo Infinite uh episode so yep. that's gonna be man if you guys haven't watched that yet it's josh and i talking about all the technology within uh halo infinite and so kind cool. of how it, how it maybe translates to the real world so yeah yeah man so that's really really cool you can go to the debrief.org uh to check that or just type in the debrief tech talk into youtube uh as well as astral stew we got an astral stew episode out as yep. well talking about love and the paranormal man yep. love in the astral plane alien love it's all about it we got a lot going on josh man that's we all do. i'm saying that's all i'm saying do. stick around next week we've got another guest alumni coming on the show jim schmidt uh, who wrote The Way of Existence, uh, that really phenomenal book about one of his past lives uh, that was just mind-blowingly good. He's going to be on with us discussing dimensional shifts, uh, digging into the convergence enigma into yep. that theory, boy, let me tell you, because that plays a lot into all of this as well. <laughs> yep, it certainly does. So, but anyways, thank you guys so much for tuning in to the Convergence Enigma with Josh and Stefan. I have been your host, Stefan Gearhart, and I always want to remind you to please keep your eyes on the skies. And this has been Josh, and the truth really is now. I mean, we are living in so much truth right now. (laughs) That's right. Uh, And just a reminder, folks, don't forget to keep searching and keep questioning. Good night, everybody. Good night.